Cowboys fans have to be energized about Dak Prescott being ready to go for week one in Tampa after watching Hard Knocks last night. The first episode of the season was brilliant and informative, and NFL Films never disappoints. The episode showed exactly what Mike McCarthy told me on my Sirius XM radio show last week. This is all about protecting Dak from himself. The shoulder strain is certainly not a big deal at all. And look, if this was in season, we wouldn't even know about it. But it's not. So the medical staff and Mike McCarthy are taking every precaution, and that's super smart. Early in the episode, you saw the coaching staff huddling with the trainer when Dak was doing too much in practice. Because Prescott is foaming at the mouth after shattering his ankle last year. He wants to play ball. Prescott threw the ball lightly in practice yesterday, and that counts as a big and significant step forward. And I'm sure McCarthy and the medical team are going to remain very careful in the month of August. August is great. We talk about preseason football all the time. August doesn't count. And I loved hearing that they consulted with the Texas Rangers and the New York Yankees training staffs, and obviously those baseball training staffs and medical staffs see a whole lot of shoulder injuries. Dak is on track for big things under Mike McCarthy. Seriously. He's got a legit big three at wide receiver now that Amari Cooper is officially off of the pup list. Zeke looks great, and the Cowboys offense is going to be one of the best in the NFL, bar none. McCarthy stressed winning the division is not enough. It's all about the Super Bowl, and I love that. I have Dallas as the fourth strongest Super Bowl contender in the NFC behind the Rams, the Bucks, and the Green Bay Packers. As long as they continue to be smart with Dak, it's actually smart to talk Super Bowl potential and the 2021 Dallas Cowboys. Cool seeing Russell Westbrook getting introduced by his hometown team last night. Now officially a member of the L.A. Lakers, and Russ was emotional, having grown up in L.A., went to UCLA, and grew up rooting for the Lakers as a huge fan. Surreal is the perfect word, and you heard Russ use it there at his news conference. I just love this all the way around. Russ is a Hall of Famer. He's an all-timer. He's a dominant scorer and a team player. Mr. Triple Double, who sets the tone with energy and crashes the boards and dishes to his teammates to make them better. And he stressed LeBron is one of the greatest to ever play, and it's Russ's job to make the game easier for LeBron James, and he will. He's absolutely going to do that. That's what he does. My worry level about Russ fitting in with AD and LeBron is zero. We're talking about three dominant stars who also, this is the beauty, they also thrive getting others involved. Now, Westbrook stressed he didn't feel pressure to win. I, I live for Russ, but I do disagree with that. It's vital. He needs to win. The Lakers should win a title with the big three they have and the great job that Rob Palenka did with the role players around them bringing in cats this offseason. Whether or not he feels the pressure, I know he's going to apply it. I can't wait for two of my all-time favorite NBA players Mello and Russ to finally win a championship and they're going to do it together. I know it's going to happen and this is going to be Russ's ultimate homecoming. Turner is right and now he is literally a huge part of it. The Dodgers field an all-star team. And the only thing that can cool off the piping hot Phillies was the dominant Dodgers coming to town. How about L.A.? Timely hitting to support great pitching with a long rain delay smacked in between. And with Clayton Kershaw on the IL and now Mookie Betts joining him, the Dodgers' amazing depth and talent, it's everything. That slide by Trey Turner, I mean, how cool is that? This team is dominant, this team is fun, and they need wins like they got last night. With the magical season continuing for the Giants, it's remarkable. Look, I still don't believe in San Fran, but I do acknowledge the Giants kind of feel like a team of destiny, which is why that Max Scherzer deal was so vital. Scherzer built for games like last night and October baseball, and he's a three-time Cy Young Award winner, a World Series champ, a first ballot Hall of Famer, and he was breathtaking before the rain came last night. The Phillies are clinging to a one-game lead in the NL East over the Atlanta Braves. No matter what happens tonight and tomorrow afternoon, I still like Philly to win that division. 
And I still love the Dodgers to show off that aforementioned unreal depth and talent and ability. And, and I think they can deal with all these injuries. And I still think they're going to win the World Series. If only the Giants were turned back into a pumpkin. In talking with head coach Kevin Stefanski, he acknowledged that last year they built a culture. They built an identity. But that's about it. Now it's about building upon that. And that's a message that's been echoed by his leaders like Jarvis Landry. I know the history of the Cleveland Brown organization. I know um, everything the, the, the fans and the supporters have been through throughout the years, you know. And um, I'm extremely, extremely happy and proud of the things that we've we accomplished these last few years and last year in particular you know but you know I think like you said it's about being present you know what we did last year um was last year you know that don't mean that this year will go like that doesn't mean this year will be even better than that you know um I think what we can focus on is right now and practicing and working hard and taking these days one at a time and let the rest take care of itself and Adam, I'm not really one for coaches' quotes or cliches a lot of the time, but Kevin Spancy had one that I really enjoyed. He said, it's really easy to talk about the Super Bowl, acknowledging the expectations from the outside, but he said it's a lot harder to actually do it. He said, we're about to work here, and you can feel that throughout this building. Evan, what's the buzz around camp with this Browns offense as Odell Beckham Jr. is working his way back from an ACL injury and Baker Mayfield is entering year number four? Well, as is the case at most camps right now, Adam, in early August, the buzz is positive. But Kevin Stefanski has the ultimate humility when it comes to backing up what they did a year ago with this version of this offense much like the culture he said the foundation is there but defenses are wise to what they want to do they feel like baker is in full command of this offense and now there's a relationship with stefanski and this staff that they can make changes pretty quickly on the fly and that makes you adaptable as for odell hasn't taken part in any of the full team drills yet but he's out there at practice in full pads they're just tracking him towards week one and they feel like him healthy he's going to be as dynamic as ever and speaking of health and with these wide receivers and with Jarvis Landry having both back healthy and specific to Jarvis's situation often overlooked it's now brought a joy back to the game for guys that really banged up much of last year it brought something back to me man that um that I was just kind of overthinking things I was just kind of in my head about um, my injury, my surgery, it was my first major surgery. Um, and nobody talks about the mental side of it, you know, and that was something that really, like, was over me for a while. And um, I'm really grateful that I had the right type of people around me, the coaching staff, um, everybody here in Cleveland, my family. And, you know, it allowed me to get through last year, and I know my focus this off season was just to get better, get healthier, get stronger, get faster, and really be able to improve when I come back. Um, and that's and that part of it is paying off. Adam, I always appreciate the honesty that Jarvis Landry provides. And again, last year coming off that hip surgery, had a broken rib. He was still uber productive, but you just see a, a star in his eye right now with what he's able to do out on the field. He's also, as he told me, about 15 pounds lighter, changed his diet. So they're ready to make big plays in this passing game here in year two under Kevin Stefanski. But don't forget about the run game as well. It's pretty dynamic. How about the Indianapolis Colts smartly rewarding general manager Chris Ballard and head coach Frank Reich with contract extensions today? And I love it. These guys are sensational at what they do. And Chris Ballard and Frank Reich are worth every single penny. And look, you want to make sure when you have a phenomenal coach and a super smart and calculated general manager, you have the ability to go out and make sure these guys are locked in long term. And Reich is outstanding. Ballard is outstanding. Ballard in terms of drafting, in terms of trading, developing, dealing with adversity from Andrew Luck retirement to Josh McDaniel and leaving them at the altar. I, I just think the world of him. And listen, I love the Carson Wentz deal. And listen, there's some good news. Our friend Chris Mortensen is reporting that both Quentin Nelson and Carson Wentz could be on track for week one after their respective foot surgeries. And this is a big deal because this is only everything. 
Indianapolis, if everyone's healthy, is going to be in the mix for the Super Bowl. Indianapolis, if these guys miss time and we've been through the impossible schedule, first five games of the season, Indy's not going to make the postseason. So this counts as really good news. You have Ellinger and you have Easton right now competing for the starting job, getting the reps with the first team. And listen, I think that Easton, cannon for an arm. Ellinger, a mixed bag at Texas, but certainly has talent. This is why we begged Indianapolis, don't bring in Phillip Rivers, never made any sense, don't go crazy. And once again, to bring it full circle, this is why you put your trust in someone like Chris Ballard, put your trust in Frank Reich. This counts as great news all the way around today for the Indianapolis Colts. Got to get this off my chest. Get ready for the summer of love. Summer of Jordan love, as we are set to see a lot of the Packers second year quarterback in the preseason. And this kind of needs to happen because number one, Matt LaFleur said, very doubtful Aaron Rodgers is going to play in the preseason and you know this has nothing to do with you know naming Jeopardy host today or Aaron Rodgers likely playing for the Broncos in 2022 Aaron Rodgers never plays in the preseason and Jordan Love is going to play against the Texans and the Jets and the Bills because Jordan Love was inactive first round pick who was inactive for all 16 games last year there was no preseason last year. So last time Jordan Love played in a football game was the Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama in January of 2020. So Jordan Love needs to play. Part of the deal why the Packers have to change everything and bring in Aaron Rodgers' bestie and Randall Cobb and give him whatever he wants and put in his contract, promise him that wouldn't touch his money at the end of this year if he wanted out and would let him out of his contract and would be okay if he wanted, you know, to, to be traded was because Jordan Love can't play. Jordan Love last year couldn't beat out the immortal Timmy Boyle to be the backup quarterback. So that was all part of the deal. Got to see Jordan Love play football. Who knows if he's going to turn out to be Jordan Love or Jordan Hates if you're a fan of the Green Bay Packers this August. Got to get this off my chest as well. I'm fascinated to see how the Broncos quarterback situation plays out. Vic Fangio said that Drew Locke is going to start the first preseason game because he's been there longer in Denver, and that's cool. And then you'll see Teddy Bridgewater go in preseason game number two. Same reason why you saw Drew Locke take the first snap for the first team in, in training camp, and I get it. Look, if Drew Locke's the answer, I'd love to know the question. Drew Locke is, is not any good. I've always been a Teddy B fan. Can't tell you he played well in Carolina. That would be a lie, but listen, we saw what Bridgewater did in New Orleans, what he did in Minnesota before the injury. I actually think Broncos have dudes. The Denver Broncos with Sutton and Hamler and Judy at wide receiver, couple of really talented running backs, no offense to tight ends, a Vic Fangio defense that now has improved the cornerback position with Sertan and Fuller. Denver can absolutely be in games. You don't want your favorite team playing the Denver Broncos. They're going to be in games for four quarters. You want a quarterback who won't lose it right now in pencil. I have Denver fourth place in the AFC West behind the Chiefs, the Chargers, and the Raiders. But if they can somehow get Teddy Bridgewater to win this job and protect the football, I think Denver can actually surprise some people on how they can hang in some games here in 2021. Got to get this off my chest. Time for the Patriots to start giving my guy, Mr. Mac Jones, legit reps with New England's first team offense. Mac Jones has everything you want in terms of the savvy and the arm and the accuracy to be a Josh McDaniels, Bill Belichick quarterback. And, you know, you see the rain falling in the file practice video we have. You know, Mac Jones in that practice was excellent. Cam Newton was terrible. They drafted Mac Jones in the first round for a reason. Mac Jones gives the New England Patriots a better chance to win week one against Miami than Cam Newton, who has been shot for years. Got to get this off my chest. The Boston Red Sox are an unmitigated disaster. How about the Red Sox? They have four runs in the ninth, and they lost to the Rays. And they have now lost 10 of their last 12. 
Yikes. Boston was up 4-1 in this game. They were coming off of a 2-8 road trip. They're terrible in the field. The bullpen's awful. Starting pitching's terrible. Offense has fallen off a cliff. Look, I think the Red Sox overachieved mightily, give Alex Cora credit in the first half. I don't see how the Red Sox get it right. I don't see how they make the playoffs. Listen, I am more convinced that Boston will miss the playoffs than I am that the Yankees will actually make it. I think the Red Sox are cooked and now showing their true colors. I gotta get this off my chest. Dennis Schroeder needs to fire his agent immediately. Dennis Schroeder turned down a lucrative extension with the Lakers this season. $80 million, $80 million. He settled for a one-year deal with the Celtics for 5.9 mil. By the way, this turned out to be a blessing for the Lakers. We talked about why I love them to win a championship earlier in the show. By the way, Dennis Schroeder, I kind of dig him. Where you put him on Boston, he'll be the third or fourth scorer. He can certainly fill up a, a stat page. He can certainly, certainly be a bucket getter. Look, the vast majority of his regular season was really good for the Lakers this past year. Postseason was a disaster. You know, calling out LeBron at the end of the season, that was a mess as well. But I actually think with something to prove, he's going to fit in like a glove. Too bad his bank account has taken a major hit. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell for more videos.